Welcome to Voxiversity. I'm Vox Day, and today we're going to talk more about the social sexual hierarchy that I introduced in a previous Voxiversity. The primary ranks from top to bottom are alpha, beta, delta, gamma, and omega. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these are just names. They're just signifiers. They don't mean anything in and of themselves. The alpha is the highest social sexual rank. And like every other rank, it is at its core a pattern of behavior. And these patterns of behavior are not only significant, they're extremely useful because in addition to allowing us to identify ourselves and others, and, and where we rank in comparison to them in terms of status and other things, it also allows us to better understand and anticipate their behavior. This is something that a lot of people get sidetracked on, uh, is the status issue. I'm not saying that the status isn't relevant. Obviously, it's something that we all naturally learn to care about when we're young, and it obviously has a tremendous impact on our lives, whether we're talking about our romantic lives or we're talking about our professional lives, or even just something as simple as our place in a sports team or a casual organization. But the more important aspect is the patterns. It's much more useful to, to know what the person who is the top dog in the group is going to do or understand how he's going to react to your behavior or someone else's behavior because understanding these patterns and anticipating these patterns means that we're able to utilize them either to our benefit or at least to avoid falling into obvious traps to our detriment. So let's look at the alpha. What are the characteristics of the alpha? We've already said we know by definition that we're talking about someone who is at a high level of social sexual status. So this means the alpha is someone that other men want to be like and other men want to be around, and he's someone that women want to be with. He's someone to whom women are naturally attracted. And so alphas tend to be physically larger than the norm. They tend to be more handsome than the norm. They're often more physically fit. They tend to mature at an earlier age. You know, it can be kind of remarkable sometimes. You know, I was young for my class year, and so, you know, I remember being astounded when I was in junior high, just the physical size of some of these guys who were more or less my age. Some of them you know, were shaving and had full mustaches by ninth grade. And so these early development advantages have a tendency to percolate into the individual's mindset. You probably know about the concept of the, the glory days the football hero who's never really gotten over the fact that he was a football star, or the pretty girl who still thinks that she's a pretty girl and acts like it, even though she's 40 pounds overweight. In the same way, there's also the, the negative version of that. Sometimes it's hard for people who have been social rejects and who have been on the low end of the totem pole it's sometimes hard for them to adjust when in adulthood they become successful and popular. And so the mindset that is often created in these boys with developmental advantages often has a tendency to translate itself into some of the alpha behavioral characteristics as they get older. So alphas tend to be very confident. They tend to be prone to an amount of blustering and posturing. They tend to behave in a manner that is, is very extroverted and it often strikes more introverted people as being somewhat buffoonish. And if you're starting to get a picture here of someone, yes, President Donald Trump is without question an alpha. It's also very common of alphas that they are not very faithful to their wives or to their girlfriends. They have a tendency to be uh, involved with multiple women at the same time. And they also have an ability to be allowed to do that by the women they're betraying. And you know, this, of course, often tends to outrage lower status men who, who can't understand 
why women put up with this, but that's one of the benefits of status. What are some of the other characteristics of alphas? They tend to be conflict seeking. They tend to be drawn to group activities. They are very, very hierarchical and they're very conscious of hierarchy and they're also conscious of their own place in the hierarchy. It's often very interesting when two alphas meet because the first thing that they immediately do is size up which of them has superior status. They don't actually tend to engage in much conflict, direct or indirect, once they have satisfied their need to determine who is the top dog and who is the second banana. Now, alphas are not betas. They're not content or happy to be a second banana. They don't seek that position. But when they do have to deal with each other, they usually tend to get along pretty well as long as it's very clear which one of them has the superior status. Where you run into problems with alphas is when you have two of them that are of fundamentally the same status and it's not easy for them to resolve it quickly. Other issues that, that you have with alphas, uh, especially in the business world, is that they don't tend to create succession plans very well. Whenever you have an alpha, they usually do best when they're teamed up with a beta. The problem is that the beta is almost never capable of actually fulfilling the alpha's role. And so you see situations like uh, we see with Apple now happening all the time. You had an obvious alpha, Steve Jobs, but when he was replaced by Tim Cook, who is not an alpha, Apple suddenly lost those unique elements that Steve Jobs brought to his position. Alphas provide vision. They provide leadership. They don't necessarily do the direct work themselves, but they inspire others to do it. That's what's always important to understand is that any organization, any group needs a leader in order to be effective. And alphas above everything are effective leaders. So when you're looking at your group, when you're trying to decide who should be in charge, it's a mistake to focus on who happens to have been there longest or who happens to know the most or who happens to be the smartest. What you're well advised to do is to determine who has the most alpha characteristics in the group and that will probably give your group the best chance of success. Now, a lot of people are envious of alphas because it does come with a lot of perquisites, but it's important to remember that despite the best efforts of pickup artists to tell you how to simulate alpha activity, how to fake it until you make it and all that sort of thing, all of their techniques are primarily focused on the sexual aspect. And that's not going to do you any good on the social side. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're successful in attracting very attractive women, that is going to increase your social status. That's true but it's not going to change your behavioral patterns. It's not going to change your internal attitudes. It's not going to change the way that you interact with others. And one of the most important things to understand about alphas is that they feel great loyalty to those who follow them. This is something that gammas in particular find difficult to understand or accept. The hierarchy requires mutual loyalty from below to above and from above to below. And so that's why you'll see people turning to their alpha and bringing him their problems. A good example of this is from the movie The Godfather. In The Godfather, you see all these different men coming to The Godfather, telling him of their problems in the expectation that he's going to help them resolve them. And he does because that's the price of his status. The Godfather would not maintain his high status, he would not maintain his alpha status in the group if he were to simply ignore them, if he were to simply do what he wanted rather than pay attention to the needs of his subordinates. And so this is a seldom understood aspect of alpha and it's why many non-alphas like myself actively resist attempts to pull us or more often push us into positions of leadership because we don't want that burden of responsibility. And it is a burden and it is a responsibility.
Now that doesn't mean that all, you know, all alphas are particularly good about this. You can be good at fulfilling a role or you can be bad at fulfilling a role, but the expected role remains the same. And so if you are someone who is hoping to increase your status, you need to understand that part and parcel of that is accepting the responsibility of the good of others. Now, if you're looking at the if you're looking at the sexual side, you may say, well, what is the connection between the social side and the sexual side? I mean, yes, we know that that women like good-looking men. We know that women like successful men. And we know that women like confident men. Does all of that go into making an alpha? Well, it can. But again, if you have enough of one element, that may be sufficient in that particular arena. If you are massively confident to the point of seeming overconfidence, then that may compensate for a lack of height, a lack of looks, a lack of hair, a lack of wealth, but it is a necessary component of it. In fact, I would argue that of all the various aspects of alpha, a genuine overconfidence is probably the most important aspect. Now, there's, there are also unattractive aspects to alpha beyond uh, the previously mentioned unfaithfulness. One thing that tends to strike some non-alphas as being borderline ridiculous is the way that alphas tend to come off as almost paranoid to relatively high status men. I'll give you a story of, of one alpha that I encountered and it was, it was rather amusing. He was the CEO of my father's company. And one day I came into his office and even though I didn't work for the company, even though I had no interest in working for the company, because he was a you know, big paranoid alpha, he tended to view me as a potential challenge. Now I thought this was ridiculous, but it was very clear from his interactions with me that he was always vaguely suspicious. You know, what's this guy up to? Is he potentially going to undermine me in some way? And it was, and, and he was a big, powerful guy. I mean, we're talking about maybe, maybe 6'2", 260, 270, a big guy. <laughs> and I went into his office and he was sitting behind his desk and there was a chair on the other side of his desk. So I, I sat in it as you do. And he, he actually got up out of the desk, walked around it and was standing there literally looming over me because he wanted to communicate that he was in charge. Now, he was in charge. I was not challenging him in any capacity, but that's how alphas tend to react to people that they feel might have an ability to challenge them. And you know, the advantage of, of knowing these things is, for example, when I'm on uh, my soccer team and I detect the captain getting a bit disgruntled you know, because I've said something, I know that it's because it's his alpha paranoia talking. He's concerned because I came up with a good idea. He is concerned that this will somehow undermine his position. And so what I do is as soon as I detect that there is any of that sort of paranoia at work, I do something to make it clear that I'm deferring to him to make it clear that I'm not challenging his authority in any way. And that invariably solves the problem very quickly. And this is something that you might have to do from time to time if you're a competent individual, because you never know what's going to set off an alpha. Another thing that you need to be cautious of is if you are involved with a highly attractive woman, the alphas around you are almost invariably going to try to hit on her. They will probably do it in a, oh, just joking, just, just making jokes, but they will do it. And so you need to be prepared for that and decide ahead of time how you want to handle it. The key thing is to generally make it clear that this sort of behavior is not acceptable, but to do so in a manner that doesn't somehow publicly humiliate them. Because you need to be very careful about challenging or much less humiliating an alpha. They, they can take it in a one-to-one -one setting, but if, it's in, in, but if it's in a public setting, it doesn't go well because they feel the need to 
maintain their status. And, and alphas are physically violent in a way that most men are not. They are usually quite willing to try to defend their status with their fists. And this can be shocking, especially to gammas who are direct conflict avoidant when they engage in a passive aggressive attack that the alpha sees correctly as a challenge and then deals with the challenge directly. You know, it's not easy being an alpha and I'm not an alpha. I'm simply saying that from my observations of them. They have to be on all the time and they're constantly concerned about where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the other alphas. Because remember, the, these social sexual hierarchies are fractal. And so who is an alpha in one situation is not going to be the alpha in a different situation. You might be the alpha of your high school football team, but by the time that you get to the NCAA, you're just a guy. And this is something that a lot of alphas have some difficulty adjusting to initially. But like I said, because they're so hierarchical, they're usually able to fall in line relatively easily. And when they get back to their smaller hierarchy, they will slip into their old role uh, quite happily and usually with a fair amount of success. So that's the alpha. And next time we're going to talk about the most interesting of the ranks in the sociosexual hierarchy, which is of course the gamma. This is Vox Diversity. I'm Vox Day. <laughs>